All right, so we're talking about proteins, remember? Good. So, proteins are polymers, and they're constructed from amino acid monomers, and they're constructed from about 20 different kinds of amino acids in your body. About 20 different kinds, that's all. And we can make thousands, hundreds of thousands of different proteins from just 20 different amino acids. Okay? Now, of those 20, eight we consider essential amino acids. Now, when you're a little baby, there's actually nine essential amino acids, but let's just not worry about that. As adults, eight essential amino acids. That means your body cannot make those eight essential amino acids. All right? You have to take them in in your diet. Some foods contain all eight and more of those essential amino acids. Okay? We consider those complete proteins. So some proteins you eat are complete proteins because they contain all the amino acids that you can't make and some more. Some foods, however, are incomplete proteins. They don't contain all eight of the essential amino acids. So many plants are incomplete sources of protein. That's why if you're vegetarian, you've got to be kind of careful how you eat. You've got to make sure that you have complementary sources of protein. So if maybe one food source has three or four or five of those essential amino acids, you have another food source which covers the other ones that that one doesn't have. All right. So 12 of the amino acids that your body can make from scratch. You don't need to take them in your diet. All right, so a protein then is a biologically functional molecule that consists of one or more polypeptides. And you know what polypeptides are? They are chains of amino acids. And we'll look at that in a lot more detail in a moment. So protein then is the biologically active or functional form of one or more polypeptides. Okay? Is everybody okay with that concept? Polypeptides are not really biologically active or functional, but the polypeptide can be made to be functional when it has the correct shape or when we complex one or more polypeptides together. Oh. I jumped the gun a little bit. All right, so let's have a closer look at amino acids then. Now, we did have a look at these in lab, so hopefully this is just re refreshing your memory. So the amino acids are the monomers of proteins. And you can break down the amino acid into four parts. You've got a central carbon, and I'm going to draw it on the board, and I encourage you to draw it in your notes, because I think drawing is a fantastic way for you to remember. So there's a central carbon. That's the first part. All right. Attached to that carbon is a carboxyl group. You know what the carboxyl group is, don't you? C, double bond, O, OH. And then there's an amino group, which is a nitrogen with two hydrogens. There's your amino group. And then we've got the variable R group, the remainder, the rest of the amino acid. And of course, we've got a hydrogen up there, which we usually write in, but we don't have to. So every amino acid has the amino, the central carbon, and the carboxyl groups, and that hydrogen. But it's this, the R group, which varies among amino acids. So if we've got 20 different amino acids, how many different R groups have we got? 20. Okay. All right, so have a look at the screen. There's our central carbon. What's this one? Amino group. Yep, your amino group. Oh, I got it the wrong way around. Oh, carboxyl group, amino group. And there's your side chain, the remainder group. All right. Good. So, here are some molecular diagrams of several different amino acids that have nonpolar side chains or nonpolar R groups. 
Now, glycine, we looked at in lab, didn't we? Do you remember? It's very, very simple. The remainder group, the R group, is just an H, a hydrogen. And we also looked at alanine, also very simple. That R group, the remainder group, is simply a CH3. All right, now we're going to get a little bit more complex, and let's do valine. Let's do leucine, isoleucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and proline. So look at the structure of these side chains, and they're predominantly nonpolar covalent bonds. That's why they're nonpolar side chains. Having a nonpolar side chain means that you are hydrophobic, right? You don't like mixing with water. So all of these amino acids have side chains which don't like mixing with water. All right. Do you think just looking at the structure of those side chains, you could have made that inference? Yep. If there's loads of carbon-hydrogen bonds, oof, you know it's going to be nonpolar. All right. Okay. Good. You've got to remember every one of those, by the way. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I love the look on your faces. Everyone, goes, <gasps> shock, horror. All right. So these amino acids then have polar side chains, and they're hydrophilic. So what about this one you think makes it sort of non, uh, makes it polar? What, what about that side chain if you're just looking at it? The OH group. But not just the OH group, the fact that we've only got, look, one carbon, two hydrogens, and then the OH group. So it's almost that ratio, okay? There we've got another OH group. There we've got an SH, a sulfur hydrogen. Again, another OH group. There we've got oxygen and nitrogen. Again, polar covalent bonds and the same just there. All right, so there's some of our polar side chains that are hydrophilic. So, no, I was jo totally joking about remembering all the amino acids. All right, if you want to, awesome. <laughs> I'm never going to ask you. Those of you that are biology majors and you go take, I know, you three, four, five hundred level classes and you really get into some of this stuff, or maybe grad school, yeah, you should probably remember them all. At this point, no. Unless you've got spare time. Yeah. And you like the challenge. Okay. I tell you what is kind of nice is remembering most of their names, or at least what the three letter code stands for. Okay. All right. So here we have some amino acids then that have got electrically charged side chains, and they're also hydrophilic. That usually means that they ionize in water. All right? And you can see negative charges, negative charges, positive, positive, positive charges. Okay? All right, so these amino acids then have got different properties. You've got the ones that repel water, the ones that kind of like water, and the ones that ionize. Okay? All right. So, polypeptides. Poly means. And what does peptide refer to? Peptide, think about, we've encountered a peptide bond, right? Where was the peptide bond important? Is it where it was dehydrated? After a dehydration reaction, a peptide bond can form between what? Oxygen If you had to have a guess, what, what monomers would peptide bonds form between? Amino acids. We're talking about proteins. Amino acids, right? Peptide bonds link amino acids together. Don't, do you remember from lab? Apparently not. Apparently not. All right. Apparently not. Okay. All right. So polypeptides, many peptide bonds. You can think about it like that. All right. But strictly speaking, a polypeptide, these are unbranched, which means they're linear polymers made from amino acids. So they are big, long chains of amino acids joined together. Amino acids joined together by what kind of bond? A peptide bond. You definitely need to know that for the next test. All right? So I do want you to remember the name of all of the bonds for all of the different macromolecule groups, the name of the bonds that link together in the monomers. Let's just, do you want to review that quickly? Yeah. What are the bonds that link together sugars in carbohydrates? 
glycosidic linkages. What are the bonds that link together amino acids in proteins? Peptide, Peptide bonds. bonds. Now, mm, for the lipids, it's a little bit different, isn't it? Let's just take fats, a triglyceride. What's the name of the bond that links together a glycerol and a fatty acid? Anyone remember that one? Good, an ester linkage. Yep. An ester linkage. You wrote it real small? All right. Yeah, I have it and they're starting on bullet points. You know that table that we went over in lab? I said it's a fantastic way to study to fill out this table completely. Have another row, right, or column. I can't remember how we construct it. It says the bond type or the bond name that links the monomers. Learn it and self-test. You'll be good. So polypeptides then, they vary in length. Sometimes there's just a few amino acids in a polypeptide chain, and sometimes there are thousands of amino acids in the polypeptide chains. All right. Now, each polypeptide has a unique linear sequence of amino acids in a similar way that each word has a unique sequence of letters in it. Each polypeptide chain has got a unique sequence of amino acids. All right. So let's see then how the amino acids are joined together, forming a peptide bond, and it's just a dehydration reaction. So here's one amino acid. Now, I want you to look at this and I want you to sort of dissect it apart real quick, all right? And say, all right, here's our central carbon, there's our hydrogen, there's an amino group, there's the carboxyl group, which is covalently bonded to this amino group, there's our side chain, good? There's the other amino acid, amino group, central carbon, carboxyl group, covalently bonded to that amino group, and there's your peptide bond. Peptide bond is the bond that joins together the amino acid. It's always between the carbon and the nitrogen. Okay? Now, when we look at a polypeptide chain, this particular one has how many amino acids? Only three. Just three amino acids. Right? One, two, three. This amino carbon carboxyl, amino carbon carboxyl, amino carbon carboxyl forms the backbone of the polypeptide chain, okay? And the side chains, which are the R groups that stick out, the variable part, they form the side chains part. So a polypeptide has a backbone and side chains. Good? Okay. Can we add another amino acid to this three amino acid polypeptide? Yeah, absolutely we can. What kind of reaction do we perform? a dehydration reaction, all right? And what bond results? Peptide bond, good. All right, good. There's our OH, there's our H, forming the water, to join the carboxyl to the amino group, and there's your dehydration reaction, peptide bond results, okay? All right. So the function of a protein then depends on its three-dimensional structure. We've talked a lot about structure-function relationships, haven't we? The structure determines its function, and that's true at a molecular level. So the very precise and specific three-dimensional shape of the protein determines its function. Function results from its structure. So that three-dimensional structure is critically important to the correct functioning of these proteins. So functional proteins then consist of one or more polypeptide chains that are twisted and folded and coiled into a very unique and specific and precise three-dimensional structure. All right. So we can take that long chain of amino acids and coil it and fold it and twist it and bend it into a very unique three-dimensional so structure. we look at it and we say that like, it just looks random and just like it's just all messed up, but that's actually a specific 
Yeah. Design. I'm going to show you some diagrams of protein showing their very specific and unique shapes. So it's like origami. It totally is. Yeah. Okay. I like that analogy, actually. Thank you. All right. So let's have a look at the movie, shall we? The movie's always good to look at. Bring popcorn. No popcorn? Always bring popcorn to lecture. We always have movies. <laughs> Or if you want to be really cool, bring chocolate. Give some to me. Most proteins are folded into a complex globular shape. Each protein molecule consists of one or more chains of amino acid monomers. The amino acids are linked by peptide bonds, so a protein polymer is often called a polypeptide. Because they are so complicated, proteins are usually described in terms of four levels of structure. Good, so that's kind of an intro, all right? So there you've got your polypeptide chain, each one of those little circles is a different amino acid linked to each other, all right? And you saw in the movie how they kind of took this complex shape and unraveled it into that long chain, all right? So we're gonna start with the long chain and I'm gonna show you the different levels of protein structure and how we end up with that complex three-dimensional structure at the end, okay? All right, so here are some different models of a protein which is your lysozyme, lysosome enzyme, sorry, lysosome enzyme, which we find in lysosomes. Lysosome enzyme, hang on, lysosome enzyme, all right? Oh, crikey, all right, let's get this straight. It's the lysozyme enzyme in a lysosome. In a lysosome, there you go, good. I'm trying to think too far ahead of what I'm about to say. So, lysozyme is found in things like tears. You have the enzyme in tears. All right? White blood cells have it in their lysosomes, and these lysozyme enzymes are usually there to break down and destroy bacteria. All right? So tears do have sort of a little bit of a bacteria-destroying property as a result of the lysozyme enzyme. And it's a protein, and this is what the structure of the protein looks like. So this is a ribbon model of that protein, and as you can see, we've got some of these coils We've got some folds into these sheets. But it's a very specific three-dimensional structure. And every molecule of lysozyme has that three-dimensional structure. Okay? Now, we can represent this structure not as a ribbon model, but what we call a space-filling model, where rather than this ribbon is our long chain of amino acids. There are lots of amino acids here. Here, we're sort of showing the atoms and how it fills space. And over here, we've got a wireframe model, something you could build literally with straws if you just linked them together with pipe cleaners in the right way. Okay. Now, there's a groove. Groove there, a groove there, a groove there. Okay. And that groove is an important site on this enzyme molecule. In some ways, it's the business part of the molecule. The whole shape of this is about creating the correct groove space and then some target molecule precisely fits in that groove shape. And so the lysozyme only acts on a specific target molecule, which is the right shape to fit in that groove. Okay, is everyone okay with that? All right. Okay, so the structure then of the protein is determined by the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Remember, each polypeptide has a different sequence of amino acids, and it is that amino acid sequence that determines the structure of the protein. So, what question does that beg? What are you just like dying to know? There's 20 amino acids, but when we build a polypeptide, we can have 20 of one and 30 of another and 40 of another and one of one. Does that make sense? So remember, a polypeptide can have just a few, maybe 20 or 1,000 amino acids, but you're drawing from a pool of 20 different ones. Okay? All right. So if the structure of the protein is determined by the amino acid sequence in the polypeptide, what question does that beg? What are you dying to know? What is the sequence? Sure. Every protein has a different amino acid sequence. What is the sequence of that protein? So a guy called Frederick Sanger won a Nobel Prize 
for figuring out the technique to sequence the order of amino acids in proteins, and he did it for insulin. What question would you really want to know? If the amino acid sequence determines the protein structure which determines its function, what determines the amino acid sequence, right? Yeah? Wouldn't you love to know that? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. In fact, you shouldn't be sleeping at night until you know the answer to that question. That should be the sort of stuff that keeps you up. <laughs> so, it's the C... Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't jump the gun. I'll tell you the answer to that question in a moment. So, the function then of a protein, its ability to do whatever it is that that protein does, for many proteins, not all, usually depends on the ability of the protein to recognize and bind to some other molecule, which is dependent on its shape. So I'll draw some sort of hypothetical examples on the board and I'll show you a real good one as a diagram. Let's just say here's a protein and the protein has that shape within it. No proteins have that shape, but it's to illustrate the concept, right? So here's the protein, and here we've got some target molecules. And one target molecule is that shape, and another target molecule is that shape, and another target molecule is that shape. Right? This target molecule precisely fits there. This protein recognizes that target molecule. So when it does, it will have an effect. Doesn't recognize this, doesn't recognize this. But maybe there's another protein which has that shape within it. Or so another protein. Is someone out there for everybody type thing? There is definitely somebody for everybody. It's like a romance. Yes. It totally is. Yep. It is. All right. So here's a fantastic example, all right? And this is some just great imagery. Here's a protein from the flu virus. All right, viruses are literally large chemicals. They're small particles made of a number of, number of different chemicals. Virtually all viruses have a protein coat. This is the shape of one of the proteins on the coat of the flu virus. Well, you have antibodies in your body which can recognize the proteins on the flu virus coat. Here's an example of an antibody protein. Now look at that very precise match of the protein to the shape of the flu virus protein. All right? So the ability of this protein to recognize that is because they have complementary shapes. It's a perfect shape fit. Okay. Now, think about this. If you don't have any of these antibody proteins, what these antibody proteins sometimes do is they bind to the flu virus protein. Your white blood cells then and other parts of your immune system can recognize where this is bound to the virus protein, and then it can do a search and destroy it. So this is a way to tag the flu virus and say, hey, this is bad news, get rid of it. Mm. But when you're infected with a flu virus, the flu can make new flu particles very quickly, and maybe your immune system has not made this protein yet. That's why you come down with the flu. You get the disease, oh, you feel terrible, and then your body is busily making proteins that have a perfect match, all right? So then they can latch onto the flu virus and the rest of your immune system can take care of it. The reason why, just because you get flu this year, you might still get it again next year, is the flu virus changes. It can change its surface proteins. So it makes a new protein which you don't have antibodies to and you've got to make new ones all over again. But isn't your immune system amazing that it can do that in the first place? Is that like when I say you get a chicken you don't get it again? So, yeah, so, that's, so your immune system sort of recognizes right? The shape, because it's got antibody proteins of the flu virus. So if you, even if you get the flu virus again, you've got proteins that recognize its shape and they can take care of it. Yeah. Yep. So what is the benefit of getting the flu shot then? Are they injecting you with like that virus? So I don't know what's in the flu shot, but they're either injecting protein or what they call an attenuated virus. So a virus which is basically the flu virus, which is somehow disabled so it doesn't give you the flu. So then your body is flooded with these proteins or flu virus particles which are inactive so your body can then make antibodies to it. So when you get the real flu virus particle, you've got all the antibodies and you're good to go. All right? It's a bit like this. 
you've already got all your defenses deployed, right? Rather than a sneak attack and you're, and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even lock the front door, right? <laughs> okay. All right. But that's remarkable, that shape match, that shape fit. So protein structure then is very, very complicated. And so we break it down into several different levels. All right? And I'll go over each different level and it helps you really get your head around protein structure. So the four different levels are, got nice easy names, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Now here's what I recommend you do is, and I've said this a bunch of times, but when you write summary notes, don't write out the whole word all the time. If it's a complex biological word, write it down, the whole word. But if it's some simple words that you, know, you don't need to remember, use shorthand for them. I'll show you some standard shorthand for primary, secondary, and tertiary. You can use that for primary, that for secondary, that for tertiary, and that for quaternary. So when you do summary notes, it's just a quick way to get them written down. All right, so let's have a look at primary structure first then. Primary structure is very simple, very straightforward. It's simply the sequence of amino acids. That's it, the sequence of amino acids. I can just give you a big long string of amino acid names which represents the sequence in the polypeptide chain. Okay, that's all it is. It's a bit like the order of letters in a word. Okay. Now we do have techniques to figure out the amino acid sequence of polypeptides. So we can take any polypeptide or any protein and figure out the amino acid sequence. Now, that amino acid sequence is determined by your genes. All right? You've got a gene sequence, which is specific to that gene. And the gene sequence determines the amino acid sequence in the protein. So often one gene will code for or provide the information to make one protein or polypeptide. Is everybody okay with that as a concept? You've got an amino acid sequence. Well, the sequence of your genes determines the amino acid sequence. One gene determines the amino acid sequence in one polypeptide. It's not quite as straightforward as that, but that's it in a nutshell. So are you saying that like say some proteins are subject from person to person? Some proteins do vary from person to person. But like in their structure or, or like, like I mean a certain amino acid is the same in someone's body as it is in yours? So you guys might have two identical genes in which case they're going to make an identical protein the same in you and the same in you the same amino acid sequence. There can be slight variations in your gene to your gene, which could give a slight different amino acid and sequence and a slightly the different protein. protein so to fit the structure. What's to fit the structure? The different, I guess, what the amino acid. If the you, go on. I don't know. I don't even know. So I guess the order of it does it, it varies based on like because you said structure and function and everything. So like if your structure is different on your insides, it's going to kind of just change just to fit that structure? I'm not sure what you're saying. Okay, because I'm not either. But if you have a gene that has a certain sequence, right, that gene sequence will yield a particular amino acid sequence. That amino acid sequence will determine the structure of the protein. The structure of the protein usually determines its function. Okay. Now, there are steps sort of in between and other processes that can change how that protein works, right? But if your genes are the same, you can think about it, you'd probably make the same protein. If your genes are slightly different, you may make slightly different proteins. Yeah. So is one gene made up the whole polypeptide chain, or each amino acid is one separate gene? One gene makes up one polypeptide chain. And that's not always true, but, but let's just say it is. <laughs> most of the time, okay? So if a polypeptide chain contains 20 amino acids, it's going to be a fairly short gene. 
if the polypeptide chain contains a thousand amino acids, it's going to be a longer gene. Okay. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at how we're going to look at the structure of DNA and how we make proteins from DNA in a later lecture later in the semester. All right. All right. So get your head around this. This is an awesome protein. It's called transthyretin. Transthyretin or transthyretin. And this is the overall structure of that protein. Now, it's a globular blood protein. It's also found in your cerebral spinal fluid. And this globular protein carries the thyroxine hormone. It also carries vitamin A. So it's a carrier molecule of thyroxine and vitamin A. But this is the structure of that protein. Now, it's interesting. There's some symmetry around it, isn't there? It's quite symmetrical. Not all proteins are. This one happens to be. And this is the amino acid sequence of that transthyretin protein. Good? I don't know if you can read it. Can you read it up here? Can you see the letters? Amino acid number one is glycine, number two is proline, number three is threonine, then we've got a glycine, then we've got a threonine, then we've got a glycine, then a, oh, glutamine, I think it's glutamine or glutamine acid, I can't remember. But this is the primary structure of that protein. Once it folds and does all of its twisting and folding and coiling, we get this. Good? But everybody okay with the primary structure then? It's just a linear sequence of amino acids. Okay. How many amino acids in this transthyretin protein? About 127, 127 amino acids in it. And there is a gene that has a very specific sequence that determines that amino acid sequence. It's your transthyretin gene. Okay. All right. Now, very small changes in the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide can have huge effects on the protein. Sometimes there's no effects, but sometimes they can have huge effects. Just one amino acid chain. So here's a really good example of that. Human hemoglobin, which is a globular protein found in red blood cells. It's the protein responsible for binding oxygen and transporting oxygen from your respiratory surface, which is your lungs, to the cells where it's used. So it picks it up at the lungs, transports it around your body, and then releases it at the cells. That's what hemoglobin does. Okay. And the hemoglobin molecule itself is made from four polypeptide chains. Two of them we call alpha chains. And the two alpha chains are each 141 amino acids long. And it's made of two beta chains, which are each 146 amino acids long. So there's a red blood cell. It's jam-packed full of these molecules. And there's the hemoglobin molecule. There's one alpha chain. There's the other alpha chain. There's one beta chain. There's the other beta chain. All right. So one, two, three, four polypeptides, all folded, come together to make the hemoglobin molecule. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? And each alpha chain has a very specific amino acid sequence, which is 141 amino acids long, and each beta chain has a very specific sequence, which is 146 long. Okay. Oh, the actual substance that carries the oxygen is actually an iron molecule at the center. One, two, three, four ions. And that the oxygen actually binds to the iron. And it's the protein which creates the environment for the oxygen to bind or be released. All right. All right. That's just an aside. Now, a single amino acid change, that's one of the 146 amino acids, if that's swapped, can have a huge effect on the hemoglobin. Does that seem remarkable that such a small change can have such a big effect? It does. And I'll show you an example of that right now. So, normal hemoglobin. Here's the structure of the first seven amino acids, valine, histidine, leucine, threonine, proline, glutamine, glutamine. And that gives a normal beta subunit. There's our two alpha subunits, two beta subunits. That forms hemoglobin molecules, which um, they kind of don't 
clot or clump together. They're separate molecules and they can be packed into a red blood cell very nicely. Now, look at number six. Rather than a glutamine, we've got a valine. One of the amino acids is different. As a result of a difference in the gene, it turns out. Now that causes a slightly misshapen beta subunit. So the hemoglobin molecules themselves, they kind of clump together and form like a fiber. So in the red blood cell, it has this shape. And that's what gives sickle cell anemia. One amino acid in the 146 got swapped. Where can sickle cell anemia come from then? Where does it come from? Why does it arise? Why do some people have it? Genetic. It's a mutation in the gene. That's right. The hemoglobin gene mutated. That changed the one amino acid to valine, and that gave rise to sickle cell anemia. All right. Now, sickle cell anemia is reasonably common in certain demographics, certain populations. All right. So if you're from a malarial area in Africa, the sickle cell gene is quite common there, much more common than in a non-malarial area, say, outside of Africa. Why could that be? Anyone know? It is inherited. Huh? It is inherited. Right, but let's say I had the mutation, right? It's a disadvantage to my offspring to have sickle cell anemia. So chances are that wouldn't be passed on, all right? Maybe I might die before I get to reproductive age because of sickle cell anemia. So here's what's going on. Mosquitoes in malarial areas are a vector for the malarial parasite. The malarial parasite is deadly, devastating. Right? It kills lots of people. Well over a million people each year die of malaria. But the malarial parasite, it infects red blood cells. It infects the healthy red blood cells just fine, but it can't infect these. So if you have sickle cell anemia in a malarial area, you're protected from malaria. So normal hemoglobin, great. Sickle cell hemoglobin, not so good for you. But in a malarial area, Oh, it's better to have sickle cell anemia than normal ones because you're less likely to die from malaria. Oh, so it's the, like, the people that don't have sickle cell and the people who do... Kind of. There's some selection for the sickle cell anemia gene because it gives you protection from malaria. So it's an adaptation of that, those people there? It is. Yep. That's why it's more prevalent. What does it do to you? Like, what does sickle cell anemia Sickle cell anemia. Well, look at the shape of those red blood cells. When you've got a capillary... Yeah, and that's the right way to say it, is not it capillary, a, but a capillary. <laughs> capillary is a, a very narrow vessel, and the red blood cells kind of squeeze their way through, right? Now, the normal shaped red blood cells fit just fine, but those sickle shaped ones, they block. They don't go through the narrow tubes, they can block it. And when they block it, then that particular area, that capillary bed, will be starved of oxygen, and that's why you get the anemia symptoms. It's a different kind of anemia to the anemia that's generated from, say, low iron. Okay. So how does that benefit, even though malaria is the only prevents? Sickle cell anemia is bad. Malaria is much worse. It's the lesser of two evils. Okay, it's the lesser of two evils, exactly. Right? But you said sickle cell anemia can cause you not to die from malaria. Correct. Why is that? Ah, because the malarial parasite can't infect these sickle-shaped cells. It infects these just fine but not the sickle-shaped ones. The parasite can't, can't do its thing. It needs a certain amount of space inside the red blood cell for it to develop, and it doesn't work in the sickle-shaped cells. All right, so you're better protected from malaria. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yes? That's, a, that's an awesome story. A mutation in the gene, right, which r arises randomly and spontaneously, changed one amino acid, just randomly, and it just so happens that called sickle cell anemia. Bad news, unless you're in a malaria area, then it protects you from it. That's why it's more prevalent, that um, sickle cell gene in the malarial areas. All right, so I want to show you this little animation for primary protein structure. Play. Do 
Each protein has a unique primary structure, a particular number and sequence of amino acids making up the polypeptide chain. Twenty different amino acids are used to build proteins. Theoretically, the various amino acids could be linked in almost any sequence, forming an almost infinite variety of different proteins. This illustration shows some of the amino acids making up the primary structure of a protein. The structure of a single generalized amino acid is shown below. The main backbone of every <coughs> amino acid is the same. This is what forms the backbone of the polypeptide chain. It is the R group, which projects out from the backbone, that makes each of the 20 kinds of amino acids unique. Different amino acids have different properties that affect the folding of a protein. Thus, primary structure ultimately determines the shape of a protein, which determines its function. Good? All right. So now we're going to move on to secondary structure then. All right. So secondary structure refers to the coils and the folds in the polypeptide chain. Polypeptide chain forms coils and folds. So the coils we usually refer to as an alpha helix. And the folds we refer to as beta pleated sheets. Now the coils and the folds result from hydrogen bonding. along the backbone of the polypeptide chain. Now, what about the backbone of the polypeptide chain? You think, would say, yup, I'm going to make hydrogen bonds. You've really got to picture and visualize the backbone of a polypeptide and the amino acid. What about it? There are hydrogens, that's important, and O's, oxygens, and Nitrogen. nitrogens, yeah. Lots of oxygens, lots of nitrogens, and hydrogens. That says hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is what holds together secondary structure, and it's along the backbone of the polypeptide chain. All right? So here's a diagram showing an alpha helix, and you can see the hydrogen bonds among amino acids polypeptide chain. Similarly here, here's the polypeptide chain, which goes in this direction, it would come around and be folded, and you can see that among the folds, there are hydrogen bonds in that beta pleated sheet. I think this diagram shows it a little better. Here's your three-dimensional structure of the protein, there's some coils, well, there's the hydrogen bonds, those dotted lines holding the coil shape, and there's the pleated sheets, and there's hydrogen bonding holding together those pieces of chains. Good? And is it hot in, in the helix, alpha helix? Is there hydrogen bonding between the coil, like, coils, I guess? Yeah. Okay, and that's the dotted line? Yep. Okay. All right, so spider silk has got, so the spider silk protein has a lot of beta pleated sheets. That means there's a lot of hydrogen bonding in spider silk protein. And that's one of the things that makes it very stretchy, right? And incredibly strong, stronger than steel, thickness for thickness. So I want you to visualize the polypeptide chain being very pleated like that. And so there's lots of hydrogen bonding holding together these. And you can imagine that giving it its stretch, can't you? And the elasticity, and also its enormous strength. All right, so if spider silk is a protein, that means there must be a gene that codes for that protein, right? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could go in and find that gene? You could literally make Spider-Man, right? We could genetically engineer you to produce spider silk. Do you think that's crazy? In principle, we could totally do it. And guess what? We've done it to sheep, cows, and goats. 
right? Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man. I, don't want you, I don't want you to visual spider goat, right, going down the streets of Manhattan, yeah, shooting, <laughs> shooting silk out of its horns. That's not quite what happens. But we genetically engineered them. They have the spider silk gene, and they produce spider silk in their milk. That's why we genetically engineer them. We can get spider silk from spiders, but let me tell you, you've got to have a lot of spiders, yep, and it takes an awful lot to get the silk from them. In fact, in the Victorian Albert Museum in London, there's a cape made of spider silk, golden orb spider silk, and it took about eight years to make, and about a million different Madagascar golden orb spiders, right? So it takes a lot to keep spiders, and it takes a lot to get that much silk. So we thought, hmm, cows and goats make a lot of milk each day, and there's a high protein content to it. So if we add the gene to their genome, maybe they'll produce the spider silk in the milk. And they do. The only trouble is when we harvest the silk protein from the milk, it's only about 20% the strength of spider silk. I don't really know why, but it's not as strong. So, sorry? Well, not as strong. Not as strong. It's strong. But what they were trying to do is they were trying to look at one company anyway of making bulletproof vests from spider silk because it would be very strong but very light. Yep, and they need it. Lord of the Rings. Why is that? Because in the first oh. Lord of the Rings, you know, Frodo gets that like yeah. that chain thing. He's like as tough as the dragons. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. That's what I think about the whole time. We need dragons. <laughs> Jessica, you need to take the genes out of dragons. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's have a look at secondary structure then. That's not giving it up. I don't know why this movie's not playing. If you can act out. I can't act it out. If I could, I would. Alright. I don't know why the movie's not playing. I'll reinsert it and see if that'll make it work. Okay, so let's move on to tertiary structure then. Alright. So tertiary structure forms the overall three-dimensional shape of the polypeptide. So tertiary structure is the overall three-dimensional shape of polypeptide. And tertiary structure is determined by interactions between the R groups, between the side chains. So secondary structure was hydrogen bonding along what? Backbone. Tertiary structure is interactions among the side chains. All right? Now, these interactions can get a little bit complicated, so I'll break them down for you. The side chain groups can form ionic bonds with other side chain groups. Because remember, some of those amino acids get ionized. They can form ionic bonds with each other. Hydrogen bonds can form between the side chain groups. Some side chain groups have an amino acid called cysteine. And cysteine contains sulfur. And sometimes those sulfur atoms in the side chain form covalent bonds with other sulfur atoms in other cysteine amino acids. And we call that a disulfide bridge. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about disulfide bridges after I've showed you a picture of it because it relates to your hair. Okay. And then there are hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions are where some of the side chains, which are predominantly non-polar covalent bonds, they hide away from water when the protein's in an aqueous environment. And that can help determine tertiary structure. All right, so if this part of the chain, I want you to imagine this as being the backbone of a polypeptide, okay? All right, what kind, so here's a side chain of an amino acid just there, and here's a side chain of amino acid just here. This side chain is bonded to this side chain, okay? What kind of bond is that? Hydrogen. Good, hydrogen bond. All right. 
here's an amino acid with this side chain, here's an amino acid with this side chain, look at the structure of the side chains, what kind of thing, what kind of interaction is going on here? Good, a hydrophobic interaction. Look, it's just carbon hydrogen. Ugh, hates water. Carbon hydrogen hates water. They're probably going to cluster together away from any water that's around. Good, hydrophobic interaction. And there's probably van der Waal forces as well, all right, that are holding those together. All right, what kind of a bond? So the amino acid there with a the side chain, amino acid there with a the side chain. What does S stand for? Sulfur. Sulfur. So which amino acid is probably right just there? Which is the amino acid that has sulfur in it? Did I just say it five seconds ago? I did, didn't I? Did you? I did. What? You didn't hear it? No. <laughs> I'm recording the lecture. Shall I go back in time, like 20 <laughs> seconds? There's an amino acid. Ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds, disulfide bridges. <laughs> right? You just had it. Those disulfide bridges are between sulfur atoms in the side chains of which amino acid? Cysteine. Good? Yeah. All right. Here's what I want you to think about. The hand of God, <laughs> painted by Michelangelo in the Cysteine. Cysteine Chapel. You've got the lightning bolt, right? There's your disulfide bridge. <laughs> Easy. Now you won't forget it. All right. So... Hydrogen bond, hydrophobic interaction with the surround of valve forces. What's this one? Covalent. A covalent bond. What's the name of that covalent bond? Disulfide. Disulfide bridge between which amino acids? Good. Whew. What do you reckon this one is? It's the ionic bond. What's the giveaway? Plus and the minus, yeah. Good. There's our ionic bond, disulfide bridge. All right. And what is this? Good. It's polypeptide backbone. All right. Okay. Let's see if this one works. It should. So this is an animation showing you tertiary structure. Superimposed on primary and secondary structure is tertiary structure. Irregular loops and folds that give the protein its overall three-dimensional shape. The irregular folding of tertiary structure results from interactions among the R groups of amino acids. Acidic and basic R groups ionize, and these positively and negatively charged groups may form ionic bonds. Polar forces also contribute to tertiary structure. Hydrophilic or polar R groups may hydrogen bind with one another or turn outward and hydrogen bind with the surrounding water. Hydrophobic nonpolar R groups cluster on the inside of the protein away from water. Tertiary structure may be further stabilized by strong covalent bonds between sulfur atoms in certain R groups. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Can you see how those side chain interactions hold together that three-dimensional shape of the protein? Right, I want to come back to these disulfide bridges. Now, it turns out your hair is about 90%. What protein? Anyone know? Keratin. Keratin, good. Keratin protein. Now, it's an exceptionally strong protein. Keratin is stronger than steel thickness for thickness. Very, very strong, right? But women in particular, so Pantene has surveyed women, right? And guess what's the, probably the number one thing that is on their mind they complain about? Their hair. Their hair. Typically, if you've got curly hair, you want it straightened. And you spend an awful lot of money straightening it. And if you've got straight hair, you want it curly. And you spend an awful lot of money trying to curl it. All right? Now, here's what you're doing. You're simply managing your disulfide bridges. Okay? Does that work from garden breaks down the bridges? Here's what a perm is. What kind of chemicals do they add to your hair when they perm it? I don't know. Anyone know? Never had a perm. No? Any hairstylists in the room? So they add very caustic 
chemicals, chemicals that have a very high pH. And that breaks the disulfide bridges, breaks them all. And then what you do is you force the hair around, say, a curler, right? And then you treat it again, you remove those caustic chemicals, and you maybe add some water and you let it set. And then disulfide bridges form in a different way, and they hold the hair in that curled pattern. Okay? Temporarily, if you want to curl your hair, what, what can you use? Heat. Curling iron. That heat breaks the disulfide bridges. When you cool it, they form in a slightly different way, and your hair is left curly, but it's not so permanent. All right? So you spend tons of money managing disulfide bridges. Do you hate them? No, I'm just kidding. I hate the strong It's cysteine. How can you hate cysteine? I don't. I love it. It's an awesome amino acid. All right. So then quaternary structure. Last one. Results when two or more polypeptide chains form a big protein. So this is two or more polypeptide chains that join together to form one big macromolecule. We've already talked about one protein that has quaternary structure because it's got four polypeptide chains. What was that protein? protein. We've already talked about a protein that has quaternary structure because it's made of four polypeptide chains. Oh, what? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Good. Look at that. Oh, yeah, you nailed it, didn't you? <laughs> Good. Good. So hemoglobin is the name of the protein that has quaternary structure. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. Some proteins are made of just one polypeptide. To have quaternary structure, it's got to be two or more polypeptide chains. Okay? All right. So, the same bonds as in tertiary structure, sorry, yeah, tertiary structure maintain quaternary structure. The same kinds of bonds. Interactions among the side groups, the R, the, um, R groups, the side chains. All right, so there's nothing new to remember for quaternary structure. Same kind of bonds as tertiary. Maintain quaternary structure. So I'm going to give you two examples or a few more examples of proteins that have quaternary structure. First, I'll show you the animation. So how many polypeptide chains do we have right there? How many ends? How many ends does one bit of string have? Yeah. Two. There's one polypeptide chain there. Right? You can follow it end to end. Look, I'm not going to do it, but you could, couldn't you? Board. Roller coaster. Yeah. Wouldn't that be an awesome roller coaster? Oh, my goodness. There's a, an area of biology called biomimicry, <laughs> right, where we solve engineering problems using things from nature and biology. We need to model a roller coaster after tertiary oh protein structure. That would be awesome. There's got to be something mega in that, I tell you. There's got to be. Sorry? You could like have a whole park, you know, yes. with the biology theme. And then what you could do is you could have like each car could be an amino acid, I don't know. <laughs> and then the kids could only ride the ride if they can like tell you something about amino acids and I don't know, that was that was <laughs> Sorry, you wouldn't see anybody in that park? All to myself? We'll play the movie anyway. <laughs> Some proteins consist of two or more polypeptide chains. The fourth level of protein structure, quaternary structure, results from the combination of two or more polypeptide subunits. Quaternary structure is stabilized by the same sorts of attractions that stabilize tertiary structure. Hemoglobin, the red oxygen-carrying protein of blood, is an example of a protein with quaternary structure. It consists of two kinds of polypeptide chains. Two of each, a total of four chains, make up each hemoglobin molecule. Good? All right. So, collagen is an example of a protein with quaternary structure, and it's made of three polypeptide chains that are twisted like a rope. And collagen is a structural protein. It's there for structure. Skin has an awful lot of collagen in it. Collagen's a very, very strong protein. So there's two diagrams of collagen. Here you can see the red, the blue, and the green, three different polypeptide chains, sort of twisted a bit like a rope. 
And here's a slightly different rendition of it, and you can see some of these R groups jutting out from the backbone. And then we've got hemoglobin, is a globular protein with quaternary structure made of four polypeptide chains, two alphas, two betas. How many amino acids in the alpha polypeptide chain? 141. And how many in the beta chain? Woohoo! All right. Okay, so here's a summary diagram of protein structure. There's some really good summary diagrams in your book as well. Um, this is from an old version of your textbook, which I think is a little nicer than the one that's in there right now, which is why I left it in. But you can see primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Do all proteins have quaternary structure? No. No, only if they've got two or more polypeptide chains, and not all of them do. All right, so what determines protein structure? The amino acid sequence. Amino acid sequence, the primary structure, determines the overall structure, right? The sequence of amino acids will determine where the coils and pleats occur and where the tertiary interactions are and how more than one polypeptide fit together. What determines the amino acid sequence? Your genes. Gene sequence for the gene that makes that protein. But... I want you to think about those as intrinsic factors that affect protein structure. There are external factors that can affect protein structure. What external, what environmental aspects or parameters will affect protein structure, do you think? I've already said one that does. Heat does. What else? Light. You don't even have to give me an example of a chemical, but what parameter? The chemicals create what environment? So what are we changing? pH. pH. All right, good. So conditions inside the cell that the protein is in, the pH inside the cell, or the pH of the little compartment where the protein exists, they can affect protein structure. Temperature can have an impact on protein structure, such as the heat from a curling iron. What happens when you fry an egg? Why does it turn from almost colorless to white? What is the heat's changed. Eggs. Sorry? Don't they turn from the oat stays yellow, right? Oh, oh. But the white, in an uncooked egg, it's not white, is it? It's no, colorless, clear. really. Oh, okay. Not clear, colorless. Oh, are you saying like the stuff when you cook an egg, you're taking that colorless albumin, right, which is one of the proteins, and you're turning it white because right. the heat is changing the structure. And changing structure, it's also changing the color. Okay. The salt concentration. Now, when I use the word salt, I'm not just referring to sodium chloride. Do you remember when I talked about salts? Yeah, salts are compounds primarily between elements in this column and this column, these two columns, with, for example, some other elements over there. They form ionic bonds and they dissolve in water. Okay. They are salts. Sodium chloride is a salt, for example. Lithium chloride is a salt. All right. Magnesium, I don't know. Sulfate. Sulfate. There you go, is a salt. Okay. They dissolve in water, they form ions. So the salt concentration, right? If we change that, we have it super high or super low, that can change the protein structure. Now, every protein has sort of an optimal range of pH and temperature and salt concentration. Their optimal range where their structure is so that they perform their function. Okay? If we change the pH or the temperature or salt concentration outside of that optimal range that changes the structure and therefore the protein function. Sometimes if we expose an enzyme to a pH or temperature way outside of its optimal range we unravel the protein. We break all those bonds which maintain quaternary and tertiary and secondary structure. We break them all and we unravel it and then the protein doesn't work anymore. 
So when we change the protein structure, we call that denaturation. We've denatured the protein. So denaturation is a large change to the protein structure. And when the protein structure gets changed, it becomes biologically inactive. It doesn't work anymore. So if this is a normal protein and this is its normal conformation or shape, maybe what we're going to do is put it in a, an acid or a base, a strong acid or a strong base, and that causes it to unravel. Well, we've denatured it. Now, sometimes we can renature a protein. We can make it come back to its original shape. And sometimes we can't. Sometimes we permanently and irreversibly change its shape, and that protein will never, ever work again. So I give you a couple of examples. If you take an egg, crack an egg in a frying pan, you heat its temperature up nice and high. When you put it in the fridge, it doesn't go back to being clear and runny, does it? No. That's, we permanently denature the protein. We change the shape forever. It never goes back. Right? But sometimes we can heat it up and then cool it down, and the shape does go back. So think about this. When you get a very high fever, Yep, your body temperature doesn't increase that much above normal, but it's that increase in body temperature which many of your enzymes, many of your proteins are very sensitive. They work perfectly at bod normal body temperature. The minute your body temperature goes up, oh, that extra heat starts to change the structure of the protein, and they don't work so well. And that's one reason why you feel sick. And if you have an extremely high fever, you can irreversibly change the protein structure and you die. Do you have a question? What does it do in denatured alcohol then? What is that? Oh, to... I don't, denaturing alcohol is, oh, let me think. I can't remember what you're doing when you denature alcohol, but it's nothing to do with this. Because okay. denaturing, we can talk about DNA being denatured, and it's slightly different to this. But with denatured alcohol, oh, what are we doing? I don't know. We're chemically modifying it somehow, and I think as a result, we're taking ethanol, we're denaturing it, changing it chemically, and we're making a byproduct methanol. But it's not the same idea as mm, I think just the fact we're changing it chemically. But denaturing alcohol is the same word, but it, it's a bit different. Okay. All right. I think we'll wrap it up there. Now go design a theme park, which is totally around biology. You can only ride the cars and the rides after you've met certain minimum... Well, maybe there can be like a little thing you read it and then you have to just like, once you get to the ride... I want it to be like tough and stringent. Well, we'll Hard. <laughs> We're trying to make the next generation of geniuses here. <laughs>